Data economics is a science that deals with the implications of treating digital data as units of utility and value that can enable economic activity. Now, utility, as we know, is just an economic word for use. And something with use is something of value. So to put it another way, data economics is concerned with treating digital data as raw material that can build or manufacture products. And these products can then enable us to pay for things using digital data and then measure the value of other things using these digital data-based products. So as a result, data economics lets us sell, license, and buy the ownership of utility of data, the ownership of uses of data without losing control or ownership of the underlying data sets. Yeah, I mean, the scope of this is, is potentially pretty broad, wouldn't you say? Yes, uh, it is very broad. And so let's maybe try and scope it down uh, and look at three canonical scenarios that data economics is interested in. First is others pay you money in exchange for specific units or pieces of your data. Second is you can pay others with specific units of your data in exchange for goods, services, labor. And then the third and probably the most interesting one is others pay you with their units of data in exchange for your units of data. So let's break down these scenarios, uh, especially the first one, because that is probably the one that sounds like something familiar, that others can pay you money in exchange for specific pieces of your digital data. You know, we are all familiar with business models that have to do with buying, selling, licensing digital data sets. So if we just took a broad look at what are the current models for utilizing digital data, they are as follows. There are two really. Serving as data sources for digital applications that are delivering features and value to users and hence generating revenue for the creator of the digital application. That's basically been the canonical use of digital data since you know, we've been dealing with it. And the second and a more recent one with the growth of big data platforms, uh, machine learning platforms, is that digital data can now serve as a commodity that when analyzed can produce insights leading to potentially more revenue. Data economics, on the other hand, looks at digital data from a slightly different perspective or a very different perspective. It looks at digital data as raw material for manufacturing or minting, as we call it, products that have both utility and hence value. We call these products built of this raw material of digital data, data assets, again, with a capital D and capital A. All right, so you and I have talked before about this concept um, of, of packaging up data and then selling or licensing the utility, uh, you know, the uses of that data rather than the underlying data itself. And you know, to me, this has always sounded kind of like a, a radical concept. I mean, radical in a in a good way, um, because there's this idea that you know the people generating data or the companies generating the data have more ownership or, or control over that. Um, you know, they're not giving up their underlying assets. And so, you know, I'm an analogies person, as you guys often remind me. Um, you know, I like to have an analogy for everything. So, my analogy here has been something around like, okay, I I own a, a whole lot of land, maybe a whole lot of ranch land. I could sell that land uh, to somebody else, but I could also maybe lease that land and allow someone's uh, herd of cattle to graze graze upon it um, so that I'm, you know, getting so, some use out of the land, but I don't have to, you know, give up the land itself. Um, can, can you maybe uh, run with that analogy there a little bit? But I mean, is this kind of what we're talking about? You can hold on to things, but also um, get use out of it in a way that maybe we haven't talked about before with uh, sure. data. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, your land analogy actually works really well. Um, so, you know, the difference between traditional utility of data and data economic utility of digital data can actually be demonstrated quite well with that analogy. Uh, so let's imagine that, you know, the data sets that you or your company own are generating um, are basically pieces of land. And let's say that the data streams that you are generating or have access to are um, lakes and rivers uh, for, for, for this analogy. So if someone were to say, okay, how can you utilize your land and your water bodies? How can you get use out of them and get value out of them? And you have a, a few options, right? The obvious option would be that you sell the land or rent it out uh, as a whole or in pieces. The other and probably more interesting use is that you can use the land, you can use the water bodies and the resources they contain to build products 
that in turn have their own uses or utilities. So you can mine or extract resources, minerals, oil, et cetera, from the land. You can harvest fish, drinking water out of your water bodies, and then you can sell or rent these out. These are products sort of that you just extracted from your land. Now, it gets even more interesting when you think about using these extracted resources to create new products through a manufacturing process. So let's say you can forge metallic products from extracted ore. You can purify and package the water to sell it as bottled water. You can till the land, um, sow seed and grow crops. Uh, it, even more interesting is in many cases, you can even combine these products that are coming from your land and your water. So let's say you you know, if you have the tools could combine the ore, the met metal um, and the oil to, uh, let's say, build an engine. Uh, you can, um, let's say, uh, do something uh, like uh, uh, build canals to use the water to irrigate your crops. Or if we just put everything together, you could route water to a hydroelectric pump that is then being run by this engine that you developed. Uh, so basically within a data economic frame of reference or a data economy for short, we can treat our data sets and data streams as reusable raw materials that can, used, that can be used in pretty much these three ways. So you can extract data from data sets and data streams to manufacture products called data assets that are again utilizing the underlying data. These data assets can then be sold, licensed and bought or otherwise utilized. In addition, you can then create new data assets using existing data assets as inputs or raw material. And then of course, you can combine different classes or different types of data asset products to create new data asset products. Yeah, so, I mean, this is really interesting. So this means that you can you know, create these data assets um, and then create different kinds of products, you're saying, all based out of the same data. So, I mean, for a business that's generating a lot of data, what does that mean? They could generate, you know, revenue in a lot of different ways from the same uh, data stream? That's exactly right. You know, that's the fun part about using data as raw materials and as intermediate resources to build products. That, you know, unlike physical resources, digital data can be copied and transformed without losing the original raw material. Hence, the same data set can be used to produce multiple types of revenue generating data assets, uh, each increasing the value of the underlying data set. So, so can you give us some examples, like real world industry examples of how this would work? Yeah, sure. Let me give you two examples. These are not necessarily things that we are directly working on right now. We'll see those examples later, but these are, are more intuitive. So uh, one that we've been throwing around for, for a while now um, that actually works really well is let's uh, take the example of a, a consumer music streaming application. So this application, let's say, allows listeners to stream music and for creators to upload and advertise their music. The company that's running this application is therefore collecting data both on the listening habits of music lovers as well as on the creation habits of music creators. This company can potentially create different types of data assets using the same underlying data sets and sometimes by even combining different data sets. So for example, a data asset type could package up key analytics and insights about uh, the habits and preferences of, uh, that are completely anonymized or aggregated or something like that of music creators, and then be targeted as products for, to companies that are producing things for music creators. Another type of data asset could be packaging up insights on the behavior, on the anonymized behavior of music listeners and be targeted towards other companies that are catering to music fans. Or let's say, let's go even further. Let's say that a company like, let's say SoundCloud decided to allow a competitor like Spotify to have access to the insights derived from the habit of SoundCloud's listeners. SoundCloud may not only want to control the specific insights that Spotify has access to, but also ensure that they get credit each time Spotify utilizes or profits from their data. This again is a hypothetical, by the way, we are not working with SoundCloud or Spotify. But that gets us to another example, which might be even more interesting. So let's pause for a second and think, why aren't the users of the streaming application, the music streaming application, whose data is actually powering all of this, why aren't they getting any credit, any share of the revenue that has been generated through the anonymous music consumption data, anonymous music creation data? And this is true for all data that we generate through our digital devices. Our data gets monetized, but none of the credit flows back to us. For example, one of the most valuable types of data that our phones and tablets continuously generate and transmit is location data, GPS and related data where uh, noting where the device is at any time physically. 
Cellular networks have had access to and to a great extent own the data that they are helping transmit through their networks. Yet it is you, the user, who is doing the work to create those data assets. If a system existed that allowed you to control exactly who gets to use your anonymized location data, if you so choose with, with your permission, and to also receive credit for this data being licensed or sold, then the relationship between you and your cell phone company would look very different than it does today. Not only would such a system potentially let you earn money from a share of the revenue generated, let's say, from your anonymized location data, in such a world, the cell phone companies would be competing with each other to give you value in exchange for giving them access to and permission to utilize your anonymized location data. Value which could use, include anything from uh, cell phone services to handset upgrades to other incentives potentially unlocked by your data. You might be effectively paying for your cell phone service, your handsets, and much more with your data when they are turned into these data asset products. Yeah. I mean, my takeaway from our discussions about this has been that data asset products are a more sophisticated, packaged up form of data um, that they include some level of, of meaning about what that data is. I mean, basically these data assets, as you call them, are manufactured using underlying data sets as the raw materials. And then what's fascinating here, I think from a business standpoint, is, is that it sounds like these data assets can enable all kinds of lines of, of revenue or monetization approaches um, that really have not been available um, you know, available to companies before. And, and this also is really interesting for companies that can't or, or won't or not able to uh, sell their data um, for a variety of reasons. It sounds like maybe because of privacy, data protection rules, um, sensitivity of data uh, and so forth, they might still be able to, um, you know, derive some revenues from that. Absolutely, absolutely. And that is, you know, what you just mentioned is just one of several classes of really difficult problems involving digital data that have been around forever, that becomes significantly simpler to tackle when modeled within what we call a data economic frame of reference. So as you said, the owner of the or manufacturer of the data may not want to lose ownership of the underlying data sets. They might want to control the data sets, but allow others to utilize the data for very specific defined purposes. There might be a desire in this case for the manufacturer to track exactly who uses the data and for what. There might be incentive systems that need to get designed and enforced to ensure that credit for each such utilization of a data asset flows back to its manufacturer. One very interesting um, uh, use case that you know, we've seen over and over again is that there are shared answers that might need to be formed, answers to common questions that different entities and different parties have that need to be formed from partial results that can only be derived from different data sources that are completely diverse, possibly belonging to different entities in completely different formats and with different constraints. In fact, if you take that, make it even harder, there might be sensitive data in these data sets that cannot themselves be shared, but only computed results from those could be shared that help generate these shared answers. That becomes even harder when someone wants to, without looking at the input data that was used, look at the output and verify that the correct set of input data was used. So we could go on and on into like the, the classes of very interesting problems that become much more accessible using data economics. Yeah, th thanks. Now I think I, I get that. And here's what I'm understanding so far. So by assetizing so to speak, the digital data, we're creating different types of data asset products. Each product can potentially be traded and utilized um, in its own uh, market, so to speak. Um, so, you know, one, we can have the same underlying data used as raw material to enable multiple kinds of, of revenue generating data asset products. Two, these data asset products potentially enable lines of revenue that would not otherwise be available or feasible in traditional models. And then three, each of these different classes or types of data assets could be generated from company or individual data sets and uh, transacted essentially. And you know, I'm thinking about this as well in terms of company valuations. I mean, the I know that we're going to have uh, some partners come on and talk about this a little bit later, so I don't want to jump too far ahead. But it's very interesting to me that we can we're starting to think of data here as as a little bit of a more tangible, um, a tangible good or tangible asset. Uh, right now, you know, data is really viewed as an intangible asset. And so if this were viewed a little differently, I think it has really interesting 
potential implications for um, the way that we think about uh, company valuation, but all the way that we also the way that we think about the value of all of the data that we generate as individuals, and you know what what that is worth. Who